Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to our DupraCast today. Nobody less than Steve Gaudry. Steve Gaudry is a cardiac surgeon that, have, that did more than 10,000 surgeries, and he's a New York Times bestseller author and a good medical researcher. Dr. Gaudry have, has a sharp mind that can connect a lot of knowledge and reflect about our human beings' health. So I'm so proud to have Dr. Groundry here with us in DupraCast. Dr. Groundry, first of all, how are the things right now there in California? Well, thanks for having me. Um, well, like uh, every place else in the world, we're, we're still under a uh, pretty intense lockdown in California, but our... Um, our governor uh, early on um, was one of the first to really put everybody at home. And I think well, we all think that that actually made a huge difference. Um, California is the most populous state in the United States, but it actually has for the population one of the smallest amounts of uh, infections and deaths. So, um, you know, I, as much as we all hate it, um, I, it it appears to work uh, compared to other places that, that didn't uh, aggressively lock down. So. Uh, that sounds good. I, I was in California, I think, one week before uh, the, the corona comes to Brazil. Uh, I was, uh, I think, the first one of um, the first uh, one inside a, a 100, the first 100 uh, to get corona here in Brazil. And I, I don't know if maybe I bring the virus from California, but it was like a, a, a good infection, but I am really now really okay and much better now. And I think here in Brazil, we have more one month that uh, we need to lock him down and after we can come back to our job. So uh, Dr. Gandhi, before uh, your uh, beautiful book, Plant Paradox, now is available here in Brazil in Portuguese, uh, we had a few books and or articles about some grains, about uh, how the plants could be uh, not so benefit or harmful for humans. And when was the first time that you thought about that, and why you find it important? Did, did you did this trigger come from your health or from your patients? Well, actually a little of both, but uh, I first became interested in this uh, back when I was uh, at university, at Yale University as an undergraduate, and I had a special um, a major that I could design for myself in uh, human evolutionary biology, and my, I had to do, have a thesis, and the thesis was you could take a great ape, manipulate its food, manipulate its environment, and prove that you'd get a human being. And uh, I actually defended my thesis and got an honors. And in, in my research, it was, it was actually very clear that we uh, had evolved from a primarily leaf-eating animal and fruit-eating animal, and that um, grains, for instance, were an incredibly late addition to our diet, only really about uh, 10,000 years ago. In fact, rice actually only started being cultivated 8,000 years ago. So it's actually even one of the more modern grains. So, uh, and there's very good archeologic evidence that before the advent of grains and beans, uh, that is agriculture, uh, we were actually very tall creatures. Um, we, most of us stood about six feet tall and we shrunk uh, about a foot in the 2,000 years after grains and beans were introduced. And that's why when you go to old um, cities and old towns uh, and even old grave sites, you find very small people. And they, that, that was not the case much earlier. So that made me very suspicious that um, grains and beans were uh, harmful to people. Now, more, and we've known about the problems with grains and the lectins in grains for actually well over 100 years. Um, the idea, the discovery of lectins, which are these plant proteins that 
are designed to defend the plant from being eaten, uh, was discovered actually over 150 years ago. And you as a plastic surgeon and I as a heart surgeon know that blood typing uh, was done using lectins. And that's how we discovered that there were different blood types. And just to continue that story, we we look at blood types and we introduce lectins into blood and the ones that clump and coagulate together, well, that identifies that blood type. Well, what those lectins were doing was actually causing blood cells to coagulate. And more and more research through time <coughs> has shown that one of the effects of lectins is to coagulate the blood. And in fact, there's a number of instances in human beings where people developed um, blood clots uh, from ingesting the lectins in undercooked beans, for instance. And I, I realize that rice and beans is a rather important food in Brazil. Um, but um, I actually, I have a patient who originally came from Brazil and he tells an interesting story. He, uh, his mother always pressure cooked uh, beans and rice in the old fashioned pressure cookers. And one day, like usually happens, the pressure cooker exploded and the mother became so scared that she stopped pressure cooking beans. And he was about 12 years old when that happened. And shortly after that, he began getting sick. Uh, he began getting allergies. He got multiple illnesses. He eventually developed an autoimmune disease. And it wasn't until he had come to me for his autoimmune diseases that he had read my book and he put two and two together. And he says, you know, this all started uh, when my mother stopped pressure cooking beans. And uh, he said, pressure cooking beans was, is very common in Brazil. And uh, you guys had figured out, as other cultures have, that pressure cooking actually destroys the lectins in beans. And so uh, one way around all this problem is, is pressure cooking. Amazing, amazing history. And in this... Uh in this uh, way uh, of thinking, uh, have any blood, blood type person that could eat more lectins than others? You know, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Uh, Dr. D'Amato uh, obviously wrote the blood type diet. And a lot of people don't realize that that book and that series was secretly a lectin avoiding diet. And he was actually fairly clever, um, and I have a lot of respect for him, that he took blood type O, which is the most common blood type, and decided, uh, I think without a lot of evidence, that we, blood type O's were hunter-gatherers, and that you should eat meats and fish, and you should avoid um, grains and things like that. And I think since most people were, oh, this got a lot of uh, credibility. What he did know that most people are now only beginning to realize is that type A's, uh, we all express different sugar molecules on the surface of our red blood cells. And lectins are sugar-seeking proteins. They're sometimes called sticky proteins. Well, so the sugar molecule on type A's is different than on type O's. But what he knew, and everyone else didn't believe him, is that those sugar molecules are not only on our red blood cells, but they actually line uh, the lining of our gut, they line our mouth and nose, they line our trachea. And there's been a lot of good research showing that type A's because of this different sugar molecule, are much more susceptible to contracting viruses. That the viruses uh, are much more interested in binding to the sugar molecules in type A's. And so there's, there's one 
paper, it's a pre-publication that suggests that type A's are more susceptible to the coronavirus because of this fact. And um, he, he actually got a lot of criticism for suggesting that, you know, a sugar molecule that would, you know, lie in our gut and our nose would be so important. But in fact, uh, my research and, and now many others, uh, he not only was right, but we know now that lectins uh, are after particular sugar molecules and blood type uh, does predict at least that you're going to react differently to viruses if you're a type A. Amazing, amazing. They have uh, the all meaning. Every, every time I read a new fact or, or point or a view of something, uh, first I, I go to my past knowledge and try to figure out if it have any sense. And after I try to um, do it in the practice in my body to, to know how I feel, And when I when I did that uh, with the grains, it was amazing how I I feel in much better, you know. And when uh, after that, the, these two first steps, I go to science and try try to figure out what the science is telling about that. And the science don't have uh, huge articles about. Uh, Lectins, you have some, but not huge, and uh, you, we don't have a lot of articles about uh, the, the grains and diet. And what what do you think is is the cause? Is financial uh, or interest, interested uh, like uh, the industry, or is a difficult question to prove? What what's the the problem? Well, yeah, a lot of it is is certainly financial. We we tend to forget that. Um, eating uh, grains for breakfast, having breakfast cereal, was a modern invention. Uh, it, it was started by the Kellogg brothers in 1906. And I'm, uh, I travel all over the world and I'm fascinated to find when cereals uh, arrived in a country. And for instance, uh, during World War II, the American soldiers brought cereals to England and France. And some of my patients from the Middle East, uh, cereals was not part of a diet until, oh, the 1960s, because it took, it took that long. But when you, when you look at, you know, the stories that were developed around how important, uh, cereal and breakfast was for that matter um it's uh, the advertising budgets are just enormous um plus uh, most agricultural systems in the world uh, depend on grains and beans but speaking speaking of depending on that i think it's fascinating that three billion people use rice as their staple and yet Most of those people take the hull off of rice, which contains lectins, and eat their white, eat white rice rather than brown rice. And everybody knows how good brown rice is for you, but yet three billion people don't eat brown rice. They take the hull off. We also have to realize that up until about 50 years ago, most cultures actually refined flour, refined wheat, uh, and ate their breads white. Um, and it was really only recently that we reintroduced the concept of eating whole grains. Uh, I happen to think that most people were a lot smarter 50 years ago and were throwing away the bad part of the grain. Perfect, perfect. Uh, so... I realize that you are a good observer and you are a doctor like a ego eyes. You, you go going deep uh, in the patient's analysis and you go deep in the concepts. And how will you build uh, some truth? Because uh, you, 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 you're talking about uh, things that uh, a, lot, a lot of people just uh, listen to you. Oh, this, this have a lot of meaning. But before you talk, And no one get uh, the cross uh, linking of this kind of information. So, how you you build uh, one true in your life, uh, you know, in one concept? Well, that's a great uh, question. Um, when I 
when I changed my career to trying to reverse heart disease rather than operating on it, uh, I, I've been a researcher all my life. So when I started my current practice 20 years ago, I would ask patients to uh, take certain foods uh, out of their diet and to to go to a health food store and buy certain supplements. I didn't sell them. And then I got blood work on them uh, every three months. And so I could, I could see the effect on inflammation markers. I could see the effect on cholesterol. I could see the what effect. What kind of inflammation markers do you use? So actually, well, we started using C-reactive protein, highly specific C-reactive protein, fibrinogen, myeloperoxidase, and then we expanded to uh, look at uh, IL-6, uh, tumor, tumor necrosis factor alpha. Uh, we also, I wrote a paper a few years ago showing that people who had a, a, a level of a protein called adiponectin in their blood that was high actually reacted to lectin-containing foods and that when we removed lectin-containing foods from their diet, that their inflammatory markers fell. And if we reintroduced lectin-containing foods, those inflammatory markers would come back. It's the same way my practice is now about 70% autoimmune disease patients uh, who have been really everywhere in the United States and off in the world looking for a treatment other than an immunosuppressant. And I published a paper two years ago uh, in circulation, the Journal of the American Heart Association, looking at 102 patients with biomarker proven autoimmune disease like Hashimoto's, like uh, lupus, like rheumatoid arthritis. And in six months time on the plant paradox, 95 out of 102 patients became biomarker negative and they were off of all their immunosuppressants. So that's a 94% success rate. Not bad. Amazing, amazing, amazing. And uh, plants make um, a lot of chemicals to protect themselves. Maybe lectins is one of them. Right. But why some, uh, some of these com components could harmful, uh, harm us and why others could be beneficial, like uh, phenolic compounds, like catechins, like uh, maybe some caffeine? Uh, why in, in the evolutionary perspective, why this happen? I think that's a great question. Um, I happen to be a plant predator. I eat mostly plants. Um, I eat a lot of leaves. I eat a lot of tubers. And so people say, well, you're anti-plant. No, I'm not anti-plant at all. But we have to understand from an evolutionary perspective that we evolved from a leaf uh, eating grade A. And we and our microbiome, uh, the 100 trillion bacteria that live in us, evolved to, believe it or not, eat those compounds and actually to get benefit from those compounds. And they also educate the immune system that you've been exposed to this for millions and millions of years we're going to eat them. Uh, you don't have to be worried about these guys. We've got your back and calm down. So what's happened recently is 10,000 years ago, we introduced totally new compounds that we didn't have a gut microbiome to handle. For instance, um, there's nothing wrong with a rat uh, eating corn or grains. The rat evolved as a grain predator, and it has a completely different microbiome to handle grains. It has 10 times the amount of proteases that break down proteins, and lectins are protein, than we have. So uh, 
so 10,000 years ago, we have a whole new set of foods that we don't have a good response to. And it gets even more interesting. Um, all of us uh, are not from the new world. Um, your and my ancestors came from uh, Europe, Africa, or Asia. And up until 500 years ago, we were, for the most part, not exposed to new world plants like potatoes, uh, like corn, like the nightshade family, uh, peppers, um, eggplant, uh, tomatoes. Um, these are actually all uh, American, North and South American foods. And so we've only been exposed to those for 500 years. And, you know, getting a new relationship with a food in 500 years is, is speed dating in evolution. And I think a, a lot of times we don't realize how we just have not developed the microbiome and the education to our immune system to handle these compounds. Oh, amazing. Uh, th this is not a, a, a fast track for, for evolution, like a 10,000 years is like nothing. Yeah. And he, here in Brazil, I, I talk a lot of, about uh, how bad grains can be, but I, I, I suffer a, a good resistance of some plate-based people. And you told uh, the, some, some persons uh, thought you are like anti-plants, anti -plant, but, but it's not uh, the real question, but uh, did you feel any resistance uh, from the people when you wrote uh, the plant paradox? And is, is it possible uh, for a plant-based uh, diet uh, be uh, lactin-free and still in plant-based diet? Oh, absolutely. I, I, I consider myself uh, what I call a veg aquarian. I eat most, mostly vegetables and uh, and the, on the weekends, we eat fish and shellfish. Um, and there's some good reasons why we do that. And I'm, I'll have a book later on all about that. But so um, you absolutely can be a vegan and eat this way. Uh, unfortunately, vegans and vegetarians have become convinced that they have to have large amounts of protein in their diet from, for instance, beans, and that they're, that's where they have to get their protein. Well, apparently no one ever asked a gorilla whether they needed beans to get enough protein in their diet. Uh, gorillas get all the protein they need from leaves. No one ever checked with a horse to see if it needed beans in its diet for protein, and of course not. A horse gets all its needs met by grass. And what we have to always remember is that most of the largest animals on Earth actually eat plants only. And they don't eat beans. They don't eat grains. They eat leaves. And so one of the things that I've found when I can convince uh, my vegan patients, and I have a lot of them, is that they can, they can thrive. Uh, eliminating grains and beans. If they have to have beans, then a pressure cooker works fine. Right. For, for instance, last week, uh, two of my meals were pressure cooked beans and mushrooms with a lot of herbs in them. And so people say, oh, you know, Dr. Gundry doesn't eat, you know, doesn't eat beans. Well, yes, I do. I just know how to um, fix them. And when you, when you do not uh, eat green, uh, grains, uh, which is the protein source, source uh, in uh, your diet? Like uh, which leaves do you think is a good, um, have a good amount of protein? Yeah, so uh, actually all of the cruciferous vegetables are, are excellent sources of protein. I do eat uh, quite a few nuts, primarily walnuts and pistachios and macadamia nuts. And we forget the nuts actually are, are a good source of protein as well. But there's, there's actually per ounce more protein in broccoli or spinach than there is in steak. Now, you, for instance, a gorilla eats 16 pounds of leaves every day. Uh, that's a lot of leaves. Uh, but my wife and I eat 
large mixing bowls of salad for, for dinner at night. Um, so it's, you just have to eat a lot of leaves. The other good news about eating leaves is that leaves are very filling. It's, uh, um, it's, it's really hard to eat a lot of salad before you get full. <laughs> and, and you take some uh, digest digestive enzymes uh, together or, or not? Uh, no, I, I don't. Uh, I certainly see a lot of people early on whose, number one, their microbiome has been destroyed uh, by antibiotic use. Uh, I know in this country we give antibiotics for any reason. Uh, and as you probably know, In the United States, so many of our animals are fed antibiotics uh, for, you know, to fatten them for That's food. Fun. And so we know that our microbiome is has been devastated by antibiotics. Also, in this country, and I think it's true in Brazil as well, Roundup and glyphosate is, is spread on on everything yeah, and, yeah. and Roundup in itself uh, destroys the gut microbiome. And there's some recent papers that show that Roundup actually makes for leaky gut in and of itself. So we've, uh, you know, the whole world um, has unfortunately um, been savaged by Roundup and glyphosate. And now we are needing uh, even even more amounts of Roundup, yeah. And uh, you you uh, talk about the example of the rat, rats can, that could eat grains, but uh, I, I see a lot of animals like dogs that are getting sick and chronic disease with uh, uh, kind of corn food and uh, with grains. And for those people who are not uh, plant-based, Have any information uh, to do not uh, get animals that eat grains or to get a, a prioritized like a grass-fed animal, something like that? Yeah, that's a great question. And in fact, uh, I got interested in this years ago with my one of my own animals. Um, I had a, uh, we have four dogs usually, and one of our dogs was a Cavalier King Charles Spaniel. And he became very ill. Uh, had horrible digestive issues, got chronically skinny. And the vet said, well, he's got pancreatic insufficiency and there's nothing you can do for him. And he's just going to waste away. And, you know, he's, and he was a young dog. He's about seven years old. And I said, you know, there's something wrong here. Uh, so I, I put him on, on a raw food diet. I, you know, went and got grass fed beef. Um, And this dog, within months, turned around, diarrhea went away, he put on weight, he, you know, he lived until he was 13, which is old for a Cavalier. Uh, they blow out their mitral valve, incidentally, that's actually how they all die. Um, but, and I, you know, more recently than that, had another dog that uh, developed a severe kidney failure. And a little York, Yorkshire Terrier got ascites, and the doctor said, well, you know, take him home. Uh, here's a few kidney medicines. And the dog got sicker. And I said, you know, I did this with one of my other dogs, and I, I put her on a ketogenic dog diet. I, I put her on raw Italian uh, pancetta, which is, you know, basically uncured fatty bacon. And... She turned right around, her ascites went away, she started running with us again, and she died in a ripe old age. So I've actually been on podcasts with uh, veterinarians that I think we've, dogs with arthritis, dogs with skin rashes, dogs with breakouts, um, they're not supposed to have this. And a lot of the times when we take grains away from them, they do much better. Now there's proviso. A lot of the grain-free foods, they have been instead putting peas and soybeans and beans, legumes, 
And just like humans, dogs do not tolerate legumes. And there's been recently some evidence that dogs can get a cardiomyopathy from these new grain-free legume-based dog foods. So, I, you know, dogs do not eat peas. They don't, you know, I mean, they don't go out and pick peas. They don't eat beans. They need, you know, animal food. Uh, they, they need meat or chicken or fish, and, and they just thrive. Yeah, it's uh, amazing how, how those work. And uh, if uh, the one person that uh, could uh, eat some like chicken or some uh, uh, meat, it's better to, to, to choose like an organic one, uh, like um, uh, grass fed and no antibiotics. Yes. And we, we know some persons, uh, some patients that are more sensible than others for lectins. And in, I, I, I think, 25 April, we have a good article in uh, Nature, uh, the, the Nature Scientific Magazine, uh, that um, uh, link the apple 4 gene with uh, like a leaky brain. So if this kind of persons have more lectins, maybe uh, they are uh, more at higher risk to Alzheimer's disease, to brain fog. I have uh, ApoE3 and ApoE4. So I have like a higher chance to, to get Alzheimer. And I, I have heard you talk something like that about the diet to uh, prevent Alzheimer disease. What uh, you can give uh, for the, the t tips for us about prevention of Alzheimer for those who have the Alzheimer gene. Yeah, so um, I've become good friends with Dr. Dale Bredesen, who uh, wrote The End of Alzheimer's, who I, I think is probably the greatest Alzheimer's researcher there is. And interestingly, became good friends because I was very impressed with his work. And it turns out he was actually impressed with my work. And uh, he actually uses my program in his clinics uh, for, for the diet. Uh, I think we're beginning to see, because of sophisticated tests that we can do now, that one of the big effects of lectins is to cause leaky gut. And both he and I believe that most of the ill effects uh, on the brain is because leaky gut leads to leaky brain. And that people who carry the ApoE4 allele are more susceptible, particularly in Dr. Bredesen's uh, opinion, to inflammation in the brain. And so one of the things in my work, because ApoE4s have a higher risk of coronary artery disease, for instance, and that's how I got interested in it. Uh, in general, uh, fours don't process uh, cholesterol very well. And saturated fats in general are more mischievous to ApoE4s than they are to 3.3s, for instance. And so one of the things that I try to get out of people's diets or at least minimize is uh, cheeses, for instance. And most ApoE3.4s love cheese. Um, just, just as an example. And also uh, coconut oil. Um, I don't, don't have a strong opinion against MCT oil, a component of coconut oil. Mm -hmm. But in my patients, when they consume coconut oil, the uh, particles of LDL, um, the bad particles of LDL, the ones that oxidize, actually go up. And when we take coconut oil and saturated fats down, those particles fall and the oxidation falls. The other thing that we're, I'm becoming more and more fascinated with is that uh, one of the problems with fours is like every human, we need a lot of a component of fish oil called DHA in our brain. Our, our, about half the fat in our brain is DHA. And there appears to be a, a defect in the apolipoprotein E4 that 
doesn't carry DHA into your brain properly. Now, the good news is that you can actually bypass that defect by taking phospholipids that are very prevalent in krill oil. Uh, now, krill oil doesn't substitute for taking fish oil or DHA, but they help get DHA into the brain. So um, all of my patients we have on both fish oil or algae oil um, and uh, krill oil or other sources of phospholipids. And that's actually a fairly recent discovery. And, you know, I think it's thanks to Dr. Bredesen's work and others that we're beginning to see why, you know, you may be more susceptible to developing Alzheimer's and the steps we can do to make sure that doesn't happen. I mean, I have a I have a 97 year old man who carries the ApoE 34. He runs his business. He has three daughters who will not let him retire because he's so good at it. And I assure you, he does not have Alzheimer's, and he's 97. No, no. Amazing. <laughs> amazing. And w when you use the DHA, you use uh, the normal uh, dose, or you you use in this case uh, of uh, APO4 uh, higher dose? Yeah, I, I try to get uh, I try to get everybody to get about a thousand milligrams a day of DHA in 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 capsule form. Even people who eat fish daily. Uh, can't get their, what we call the omega-3 index, uh, high enough, in, in my opinion. The exceptions uh, to that are sardine and anchovy eaters. Um, they can get very high levels um, uh, in, in them. And you, you use this kind of uh, tests like a microbiome, genetic tests, or uh, this, this kind of SNPs test in your practice, you like it? Or, because you, you have, a, how I said, a ego eye, so you can, with informations and with a good talk, and know a lot about the patient, but you use something to get a complementary analysis? I don't, and I'll tell you why I don't. Uh, number one, the, the microbiome changes daily, and it changes with the food you eat. In fact, uh, papers that are published and they're in my book show that in three days of doing my first phase of my program, you will totally change your microbiome from a bad microbiome to a, to a good microbiome. So that's number one. So I don't use those tests. Uh, the other thing that uh, I think actually anyone in Brazil would understand so the Amazon rainforest is a, is a very complex ecosystem with tens of thousands of plants and animals and insects, all of which interconnect and intertwine and depend on that great diversity. And we're now beginning to realize that that same diversity needs to exist in our microbiome, that we have within us the Amazon tropical rainforest. Mm -hmm. And what we're learning now is that the one species of bacteria may be dependent upon, if you will, the bowel movements of another bacteria to provide it with a substance that it needs. And if we don't have that bacteria, this bacteria can survive. So a subtle change between two different species may have devastating results. And I'm working, finishing on my new book called The Energy Paradox. And what we're finding is that not only do we need a very diverse microbiome, but that if we don't feed the microbiome foods that they need, that we are going to suffer the consequences as we already are. The microbiome, we used to think, and I've written about it in the books, that the microbiome made text messages that 
told mitochondria how to produce energy, that told our immune system how things are. And we had no, we guessed that they did this, but we couldn't measure them. Now there's a whole science of these transmitters that the microbiome makes that has proven that in fact these text messages exist and we can show what they do to mitochondria, for instance. So uh, one of the things that's hard for very smart humans to imagine is that we are dependent on one, one cell little creatures um, without a brain um, that actually think. And for instance, uh, you're probably aware that bacteria do what's called quorum sensing. Uh, they know uh, when they get to the right amount of bacteria, and then they do their thing. It's kind of like texting out that there's going to be a rave party uh, before the coronavirus, and, and everybody assembles at one place. So it's, it's very hard for us to accept that our fate uh, is actually entangled in our symbiotic relationship with these little one-celled organisms. Uh, but we got, quite frankly, the more we give ourselves over to feeding them what they need, they'll take care of us. So you, you, you use uh, pre or probiotics, or what do you think about the uh, fecal transplantation uh, in the future medicine. What, what, what do you think about these three kinds of treatment or prevention? Yeah, great question. Uh, actually, when I was a medical student um, at the uh, University of Georgia uh, back in the 1970s, uh, we were doing fecal uh, transplants, fecal enemas, for what was then called pseudomembranous enterocolitis, uh, which is now C. difficile. Uh, we didn't know what was causing it back then, but that was when broad spectrum antibiotics had first come out. And, you know, we felt they were miraculous because we no longer had to identify a bacteria to treat it. We could just shotgun it. We didn't know that we were destroying our gut microbiome simultaneously. But yeah, we, we were just amazed that a fecal enema from a healthy person would turn this uh, process around very rapidly. I think some of the most exciting uh, area is in the, air, in the area of swallowing fecal capsules. Sometimes they're called crapsules. Mm -hmm. And there, there's been a beautiful research project, very well designed, looking at children with autism spectrum. And what beautiful design trial of giving kids crapsules and uh, getting it so that these uh, bacteria would get through the stomach. They put them on acid suppressor drugs. They actually did everything right. And they found that the autism improved by 50% during this trial. And the effect has lasted for two years after the oral fecal transplant. And many researchers, including myself, believe that much of autism is because of a dysbiotic um, gut. And there's even more exciting information that, unlike what you and I were taught, uh, the placenta is not sterile. The pl placenta has its own microbiome. And now we know that the fetus is not sterile. The fetus has a microbiome before it's ever born. And that there's more and more suspicion that perhaps the microbiome of the placenta and the microbiome of the fetus in autistic kids was the problem before the child was even born. And if that's the case, uh, a lot of us hope that we can manipulate the, the mother's microbiome uh, by probiotics, by more importantly, prebiotics, uh, the foods that these bacteria need. And 
recently I've become fascinated with postbiotics, which are essentially the messengers, the text messages that the microbiome makes. Amazing, amazing. The, the discoveries uh, is not, not um, I, I think we have a lot of steps in the science and the knowledge. Uh, it's amazing to see and to keep uh, watching and keep keeping Uh, keep growing with that. And uh, do you think the lifestyle could change the, the bacteria? Like uh, do, when I start start uh, to to think about the adult lifestyle, when you get like a monogamic adult or a polygamic uh, person, do you think it's, it's changed like the microbiome? If uh, what what kind of situations is the the worst or, or the best situations to get uh, more bacteria? maybe in, in sex rela relationship. Do you think in your um, point of view, like scientific and your ego, ego mind, have you ever observed something like that, that uh, monogamic people have different kind of disease and polygamic people another different kind of disease? Have, have any meaning? Well, it's interesting that there is some research. First of all, um, all humans have some form of kissing. Uh, exchanging uh, oral fluids. And there is one theory, which I like, that your microbiome chooses your uh, lover or girlfriend or spouse or boyfriend by the, whether these, the microbiome is compatible or not. And we now know, particularly in females, that they can have a vaginal microbiome that's virtually lethal to sperm of their husband. And we can actually manipulate their microbiome to have a better chance at uh, a, a successful pregnancy. So there's so much that we just uh, we're just scratching the surface about how much we're actually dependent on these little you know one-celled creatures um, as i wrote about in the longevity paradox another one of my best sellers we we actually have a very small genome compared to even For instance, corn has more genes than a human. Um, a water flea has more genes than a human. But our microbiome, uh, 99% of all the cells that make us human are non-human cells. And the genetic material of our microbiome is 150 times more genetic material than our genetic material. And because the microbiome divides and reproduces rapidly, many of us think that just like in cloud computing, uh, I no longer have a giant you know, computer in my desk. I've uploaded the ability to compute to a cloud, right? And many of us think that because the microbiome genome and their ability to divide is so much more vast than ours, that we've uploaded most of our decision making uh, in terms of how we react to the environment and how we live to the microbiome cloud, if you will. And uh, the more I look at longevity studies, the more I realize that, for instance, if you look at 105-year-old people around the world who are doing well, they have the same microbiome and diversity of microbiome as a healthy 30-year-old, whereas the vast majority of people who age have a less and less and less diverse microbiome and a very dysbiotic microbiome. Um, so, you know, the more we realize that our fate is actually tied to our microbiome's fate, the better. Uh, this is amazing. So maybe for this uh, kind of uh, thought, 
uh, when old person live uh, living in a house with more um, young people is much better than live in a house with with just old people. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, we yeah. that's actually true. And and one of the things we may we may learn from this coronavirus is, uh, particularly you know in the West, we've we've stopped. Um, honoring and learning from elders. Uh, traditionally, uh, you know, multiple family, m multiple generations lived in the same home or nearby in the same community. And elders were, were valued um, because of their knowledge. They'd been there before. And now, uh, particularly in the West, um, we tend to you know, pack our elders off to home. Um, and number one, they don't have the sort of, you know, wonderful feedback from a grandchild or even, you know, their own children. Uh, and maybe because we've lost so many of our elders now to the coronavirus, there may be some rethinking that, you know, I, you know, I, I want grandma or granddad in my home, um, where they're safe. We'll yeah. Amazing, a, a, amazing way to think. And I, I don't want to take a, a long um, more time, so I, I want to do more two small, short questions. Uh, the first one is uh, three or messes practice that uh, you you like to enhance our 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 health. Uh, what kind of practice do you use, like or measures, like a stress that uh, could be um, one good stress when you will come back or from this stress we come back much more stronger? So three practices you just recommend for patients uh, to get a better better health. Well, one of the things uh, besides changing diet is I really I actually write prescriptions for patients to get a dog, um, and. Uh, two reasons. Number one, you have to take a dog for a walk uh, twice a day, whether you want to or not. And a dog will always make you get outside. Um, and when you look at the blue zones, uh, areas in the world with extreme longevity, one of the interesting things is all of these blue zones are hilly communities. And walking up and down against gravity is one of the best things that you can do. The other thing, exercise actually changes the gut microbiome for the better. And even meditation and yoga uh, change the gut microbiome for the better. And someday we may realize that the benefit of meditation or yoga wasn't how it made us feel, but the benefit was it changed our gut microbiome to a more favorable gut microbiome, and that gut microbiome made us feel better. Exactly the opposite. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's been very good human studies uh, with troops that half got meditation practices, half didn't, half got yoga, half didn't. And so it's across the board. These things uh, are great stress reductor reducers, but maybe they reduce stress by changing your microbiome. Perfect. You, you you give all, all the round and you 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 get in the in the end of the trail in our microbiome. Amazing. And uh, the last question, of course, uh, for me it's a pleasure to talk with you. I stay like I could stay like three four hours talking and asking, uh, but I don't want to take a lot of time. And we could uh, have another 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 talks. Uh, which uh, is the best? I think. Uh, the best three supplements that you could recommend for people that you, I, I know this is dynamic. Today is one, tomorrow you change, but if you uh, will get the first uh, three supplements nowadays for you, which, which three is the best for you? So number one is vitamin D3. And there are now four human published studies with the coronavirus showing that the lower your vitamin D3, the worse you are going to do with the coronavirus and the more likely you are to die. And the higher your D3, the 
l better you're going to do if you get it at all and the less likely you are to die. The second thing is people go, well, I live in Brazil, we're on uh, Ipanema Beach and I get plenty of sun. Once you get a tan, you really stop absorbing vitamin D. And Brazilians are naturally more, you know, brown skinned than, than me. Uh, so it's really important, for instance, in Southern California, where we have a lot of sun, obviously, 80% of Southern Californians are vitamin D deficient. And that's actually true throughout you know, the Mediterranean. Most people are vitamin D deficient. So vitamin D3. And 5,000 international units is a good place to start. That's 125 micrograms, uh, depending on the units you use. Fish oil. I, I can't say enough uh, about fish oil. Uh, our brains literally are about 70% fat. And there's actually very good studies as we age that the more fish oil in our diet, the bigger our brains and the bigger the areas of memory called the hippocampus. And the lower the amount of fish oil in our diet, the more shrunken our brains are, and the smaller, smaller our memory centers are. So my, our mothers used to say fish is brain food. Uh, they didn't know why, uh, but they were right. So, um, but take some fish oil capsules. So those, uh, also I'm a big fan of timed release vitamin C. Uh, we're one of the few animals that does not manufacture our own vitamin C. And vitamin C, unfortunately, is a water-soluble vitamin, and it leaves us two or three hours after we ingest it. And I could give you an hour lecture on why we should have a continuous level of vitamin C, but we'll leave it at that. Okay, if uh, we have more than 10,000 um, listeners uh, that we will listen about our talk, uh, you want to, to send some message for the Brazilians listeners? Well, I've been to I've been to Brazil many times. I've actually done uh, mission work to uh, Brazil and uh, I've been to actually most parts of Brazil. Uh, I wish I wish I could come back, but I, I, that'll have to wait a while. Uh, one of the things I can tell you, um, the reason I like to come to Brazil, besides your natural beauty and the, and the food, is the people in Brazil uh, are just some of the nicest people there are. And, and I actually say this about the Portuguese as well. Uh, I, and I think it is your Port Portuguese heritage. Uh, there's something something about you guys that just is warm welcoming just just nice <laughs> <laughs> ladies and gentlemen this is dr steve Gaudry. doctor thank you for you your being that kind of genius doctor who sees a lot of behind the scenes and much more than our eyes can see uh, your scientific mind and your curiosity is helping a lot of people including me and we are waiting for you here in Brazil more times. And then I, I will send my personal contact for you. And I, I will just ask for the people to send uh, the, the links, how the people could uh, write to you or if any Brazilians yeah. want to uh, get some consultation online. Now we are, we are with a, a consultation by Internet. So some Brazilians could uh, be helped by your knowledge. Thank you very much for your time. I will stop the I will stop the recording. Um, yeah.